very much, um, Abby, and thank you for being so well disciplined in keeping to the time that's available. Thank you. Um, we want now to pick up on, on one of those uh, summary points that you made, namely about the legal framework, and go to Professor Parosha Chandra, the Professor of Modern Slavery Law at King's College uh, London. We've asked each of our uh, expert panelists if they will address a particular aspect of this issue and the issue the the, the aspect that we've asked Parosha to um, address is is the measures that are needed to enhance investigations and prosecutions of child trafficking and and how the anti trafficking directive might be revised to achieve this and if you could tell us that in about eight minutes, uh, Parosha, that would be very, very helpful. Thank you. Hmm. I'll do my best. Thank you. Um, I'm in an area near the sea and uh, the, uh, I keep getting a message that the connection is unstable. If, if you see that, if you can't hear me properly, then just put up your hand and I'll switch off the camera. So um, firstly, I'm delighted to be here today. Thank you very much for inviting me. I've been involved in the work of LUMOS um, since 2018, um, when LUMOS asked me to engage with them and uh, to provide um, some legal advice on, on various areas of, of potential reform, uh, looking at the institutionalization of children and the trafficking of children into, within and out of institutional care. Um, firstly, I want to say how um, transformative laws can be for anyone who's a victim of crime. Uh, we know that generally um, from any, any laws that we have in our criminal justice system. Uh, and, but not only needs there to be a law, but there needs to be enforcement and there needs to be training of officials. Now, when it comes to the vulnerability of children in institutionalized care, I think the Cracks in the System report that Lumos published um, uh, a couple of years ago is extremely important because it highlights the types of exploitation that occur across the EU stemming from institutionalised care. And the fact that without any real compass point of the law pointing towards these types of cases, there's really no opportunity for the authorities to properly detect and identify the victims or for assistance to be given to those in need of care and support. What we know from a starting point is that institutionalization of children in the way that the EU countries um, prevent, present it, including in, in, in the UK when we were a member, uh, is to, with the aim of protecting children. But in fact, the way that exploiters operate is to find cracks in the system and to use those cracks to identify vulnerable children and to tra traffic them in various ways. I know myself from uh, three, four decades ago when I was growing up in a small mining town called Sutton in Ashfield in Nottinghamshire, that children who were in institutionalized care, care homes as we used to call them, the girls, um, they were being sexually abused in the homes and they were being sexually exploited. Um, and it was a very concerning thing. My father was a GP uh, and he used to be very troubled by this, but there was just no uh, opportunity for him even to highlight this as a phenomenon. Uh, he was a police surgeon himself and he spoke to police colleagues and they all knew what was happening, but it was very difficult um, to take leadership and for anyone to know how to stop it. Now, this would have been happening up and down the country and across the EU. So I'm talking about um, 40 years ago. And that yet here we are in 2021, still talking about it, but now it's come to the top of the parapet wall and it's time to act. What I think is really critical is to appreciate a very important aspect of law which is that as well as rights giving, it also enables a proper identification when it comes to traffic children. We know that under the Palermo Protocol definition of trafficking and under the EU laws, 
that if, if a child is recruited, transported, transferred, harbored, or received for the purpose of exploitation, they are a child victim of trafficking, and that consent is never an issue. Whether a child consented or not to their exploitation is a complete nullity, it's irrelevant, because it's the intention of the trafficker to exploit that is really key. But when we look at um, how trafficking laws have not really given um, proper attention to these forms of trafficking that happen in institutionalized care, we can see that in a lot of cases where the child may have been trafficked, the police were not really prosecuting those cases as trafficking cases because they thought as the child of um, child abuse. And the trajectory changed on that in the UK, certainly, when the Rotherham Rochdale gang grooming cases were looked at again by prosecutors a few years ago. And it was that by using trafficking understanding and trafficking laws, then the prosecution of the perpetrators could take place by accepting the irrelevance of consent of the children. So what I'm saying is that even when there are laws, sometimes they're not understood properly. So now we're at a stage of actually asking for laws that are in place to be used properly, but also we need a development of those laws to include, for example, in the concept of exploitation, the um, acceptance that children who are exploited in these types of cases that Lumos has shone light on it, are engaged in as victims of institutional related trafficking. Now I also want to mention something else about the law which is that unless the law actually targets the types of perpetrators who are involved in these activities it's very difficult to um, prosecute them and so one of the amazing things that the EU directive did which the Council of Europe trafficking convention hadn't done, nor Palermo protocol, was to identify that trafficking can take place for the uh, purposes of criminal activities. And so what happened then was that the children who were being trafficked for criminal activities, for example, for the um, manufacture or trafficking of drugs, could then be recognized as being victims and they could uh, give evidence, whether it was in person or through uh, other um, intercept means to uh, bring down the trafficking gangs. The link with that is that once in the UK we had accepted, and in fact it happened as a consequence of some of my cases that I brought on non-punishment to um, have the criminal convictions of trafficked children overturned for cannabis cultivation, it then became clear that when the authorities were finding children in conditions of criminal exploitation, and I'm now talking about domestic children in the UK, homegrown children, they were finding that a lot of the children who were being recruited for the county lines uh, cases, which are the trafficking of A class, class A drugs up and down the country, were being recruited from in institutional care. So law and policy, research, practice, and intelligence, intelligence from us as members of civil com uh, community, as well as intelligence from the police in the way that intelligence can be used to create evidence. Uh, it's all a framework that needs to play together. And the role that LUMOS is taking, a leadership role in this very complicated and very necessary area is to be highly commended because by bringing the plight of trafficked children in institutionalized care to the top of the parapet wall, light is shone on their plight, law can be changed to move closer to their protection, we can prosecute more offenders, we can find more effective prevention strategies, and the partnership between civil society and the state can grow stronger, because children are traumatized, when they're trafficked they lose education, they're exhausted, they're tired, their futures can be taken from them. So let's start to readdress what's gone wrong. And with the help of you all, I'm sure we'll get there. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, in, in, indeed.
Um, we, we now, uh, I'm, I'm delighted that we've been joined by two members of the European Parliament, both of whom are, are, rapport, are rapporteurs on the Parliament's report uh, on, uh, on the anti-trafficking uh, directive. We have Mr. Lopez Anguilla and Ms. Rodriguez uh, Ramos. Uh, they may not be able to stay for the whole uh, session, but I, I do hope they'll stay as long as absolutely uh, possible. So could we perhaps move over to you, Mr. Uh, Ang Anguilla? We've, given, we've asked both of you to address broadly the same issue, namely that 10 years after the um, anti-trafficking uh, 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 directive, given the sorts of evidence that we've been hearing about this morning, uh, could revisions to the directive benefit uh, children in institutions oh. at the risk of, of trafficking? And do you have views on what aspects of the directive uh, uh, would need to be either reinforced uh, or, or amended? Thank you very much. Don't think we're hearing you, um, uh, Mr. Anguilla. No. Sorry, still not hearing you. No. Well, I, I, um, I wonder if one of my colleagues could just um, see whether we can... Uh, he's not muted, but somehow it's not working. Not working. Maybe would it be possible to connect a headset, maybe, Mr. Aguilar? Sometimes that's, that works. Right, right. Because I think it's the computer settings, it's not uh, Zoom, because I can see he's unmuted. Yeah. Um, we're st still not able to hear you. Ah, good, it's got, got a headset. Yeah. Let's see if that's... Does can you hear me now? We can hear you now. That's excellent. Thank Great. you. Yes. Okay. Okay. I'll do. I'll do it with the headphones. Yes. Yeah. So I was saying. First of all, thank you. It is my pleasure to be part of this discussion on institutional trafficking organized by International Charity Lumo. So it's my pleasure to present the case of the European Parliament, particularly in view of the ten years that have passed since Directive of 2000. 11, Directive 36, 2011, was adopted on preventing and combating trafficking of human beings and protecting victims, representing by now the main instrument to combat trafficking of human beings within the European Union, together with the EU strategy on combating trafficking of human beings that was adopted 2011, 2021, 2025. By December 2018, the Commission issued the second report on the progress made in the fight against trafficking of human beings, identifying gaps in the implementation of the current legislation at member states level, followed by a communication during this mandate of the European Parliament 2019-2024, both committees of the European Parliament, the Libe Committee, which is a Committee of Liberty, Justice and Home Affairs, which is responsible for making laws on criminal law and procedural guarantees, along with the FEM Committee, which is Equal Rights Committee, we have worked and prepared a so-called implementation report on the Directive of 2011. And we adopted that report, implementation report, in February this year. And I was one of the co-rapporteurs along, as, as Libre rapporteur, along with the FEM rapporteur, which is Soraya Rodriguez. In this report, it was noted that children sums up nearly a quarter of all victims in the European Union. Boys and girls, particularly girls, making up the vast majority of victims of trafficking of human beings. And 75% of that sum is 
EU citizens. So we're not talking about simple exploitation, sexual exploitation of foreigners in the European Union, but also exploitation of European citizen born children, boys and girls, mostly girls. While the report had a general approach on child victim, several recommendations we included are of relevance for children as, at risk of trafficking and exploitation in orphanages, orphanage, which is a highly risk point that we should mind. I would therefore mention some of these recommendations. Okay, first is the obligation to pay special attention to child victims of trafficking with the best interest of the child being considered paramount in all actions. Ensuring strong child protection measures, presumption of childhood and child as age assessment, protection before and during criminal proceedings, access to unconditional assistance, compensation, non-punishment and assistance and support for the family members of a child victim, as well as prevention. Focusing on identifying child victims, helping them to avail themselves of their rights. Importance of child-friendly justice, which, by the way, is one of the points that have been highlighted by the current Slovenian rotating presidency of the European Union, has put high on the agenda protecting victims of child abuse in a child-friendly justice by means of specialized services and the need of measures to ensure adequate and pro appropriate training, in particular legal and psychological training for those working with child victims of trafficking. In this context, it is important to ensure that professionals who come into contact with child victims, including law enforcement, but also social and health workers, or those who work in youth care facilities are trained properly and sufficiently trained, identifying, supporting, and referring child victims of trafficking of human beings. In a chain approach, developing links between trafficking of human beings, support, and a specialized center for the support and reception of victims. Then we need to implement fully Directive 2011, because we have seen gaps in the member states' implementation on combating sexual abuse, sexual exploitation of children, and child pornography to reinforce political and judicial, uh, police and judicial cooperation, preventing and combating sexual exploitation at EU level. Need to cooperate with civil society organizations as well, just as yours, European Union agencies, to step up information exchanges to support cross-border investigations. And in view that internet and social media are used increasingly to recruit and attract potential victims, a special attention must be paid to the internet platforms to develop adequate tools. Member states should develop a model of identification, early support, and assistance for children who are victims of online sexual exploitation and abuse, as well as awareness rising programs, child-friendly reporting mechanism, because we are really, really concerned about what's been called grooming or child abuse online. There is legislation in place in the European Parliament precisely to tackle and crack down on this issue. But I would mention also a point that is of relevance in the report, implementation report that was actually very much highlighted by the LIBE committee. In the implementation report, we also call in the Commission to amend the anti trafficking directive in view to ensuring that all the member states criminalize properly, so include as a criminal offense in the criminal codes, the knowingly use of all services provided by victims of trafficking, including exploitation as suggested of article, in Article 18 of the Anti-Trafficking Directive. We deeply regret that the fact that providing knowledge in the use of services of, of victims of trafficking of human beings keeps being difficult matter for prosecuting authorities as being highlighted by professor. It is only clear that there's a difficulty of finding evidence and 
this difficulty cannot be uh, actually a, a deterrent or a barrier, not treating a type of conduct as a criminal offense, restricting criminal liability only to the situation where the user has direct or actual knowledge that the person has been a victim of trafficking of human beings, create a very high threshold to overcome for achieving prosecutions, for being successfully when cracking successful when cracking down on this type of crime. So we are aiming to avoid the use of services provided by a victim. We're also concerned about the fact that the reinforcement and insufficient knowledge of the knowing of services provided by victims of trafficking and lack of judicial practice are also of the essence when it comes to being more effective in summing up investigations, prosecutions, in reducing the burden placed on victims and their testimonies during the proceedings for evidence gathering and for convicting the, 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 those one liable or responsible for trafficking of human beings. And finally, I would like to mention that our report has recalled the root causes, the root causes driving trafficking of human beings be exacerbated through the pandemic, through the COVID-19 crisis, because there, there's a, there has been a relationship between COVID-19 and exacerbation of certain types of crime, particularly online crimes, crimes on the net, including grooming and sexual abuse on, 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 online. So it, it, it takes a, a, a thorough analysis of the, of, the, of, the, of the choices, legal choices that are to be made in order to be more effective. The report welcomed the Commission's decision to include the EU strategy for a more effective fight against sexual abuse, the possibility of creating a European center to prevent and counter child sexual abuse, a specialized center expressed also in the resolution Parliament, European Parliament, March 2021, on children's rights in view of the strategy that we have in place, its consistency as regarding the protection of children from violence, trafficking, and exploitation, with all legislative and no legislative initiatives which are underway concerning children's rights, we need to be mindful about a coordinated approach in close cooperation also with civil society. All the actors which are in place at national or EU level involved in combating all forms of sexual abuse or trafficking of human beings. Only by that we can prevent actually that crime and provide adequate safeguards for vulnerable victims as children, including children which are under institutional care, which is the issue you are discussing this morning. So I thank you for the chance to, to present the case of the European Parliament, particularly the points that have been made by the Libe Committee in the implementation report. My pleasure. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. And some interesting, uh, consistent points there about lack of implementation of frameworks and legislation that we uh, that we already have that uh, uh, the professor was also uh, was also making um do we have miss ramos with us is she is she here yes she's on the call um yeah. <laughs> oh sorry Estoy aquí. oh right um, Good. Well, welcome. I, I think it will be. I think it will be particularly interesting to hear from you what you think the chances of some of the recommendations that um, uh, Mr. Anguilla has referred to actually being implemented are. What's your 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 judgment about uh, 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 about that, Ms. Ramos? Hmm. <coughs> Muchas gracias. En primer lugar. Uh... También quiero agradecer la invitación que me han hecho para poder participar en este, en este debate y sobre todo agradecer el trabajo eh, que están realizando desde esta fundación para colocar en el foco de la trata eh, de seres humanos la situación de eh, los niños y las niñas. 
estoy, eh, eh, estoy eh, utilizando el español, creo que hay interpretación, ¿no? No hay problema. You can select English interpretation at the bottom of the screen. There is a button um, right. where you right. can go either to the Spanish or the English channel. Right, thank you. Sorry to in sorry to interrupt. Right. I wanted to make sure that everyone was understanding what you no, no, no. Muchísimas gracias y gracias también por darme la oportunidad de, de hablar en español. Eh, estaba reiterando la, el agradecimiento también al trabajo que hace la Fundación para colocar la situación de niños, de los niños y las niñas en este crimen contra la humanidad, que es la trata de seres humanos. Como muy bien ha señalado Juan Fernando, del que fui también ponente en la revisión de la directiva contra la trata de la Unión Europea, desde la Comisión de Igualdad, detectamos que tras 10 años de implementación de la Directiva Europea había algunos, eh, algunas extraordinarias lagunas que debían ser tenidas en cuenta en la, en la revisión de la Directiva. Por eso creo que su estudio, sus investigaciones en relación a los niños y niñas eh, institucionalizados que pueden caer en manos de estas redes de trata, viene también en un momento muy oportuno. Solamente señalar que desde la Comisión de Igualdad del Parlamento Europeo nos centramos eh, fundamentalmente en la trata de seres humanos con fines de explotación sexual. En este sentido, quisiera decirles que más del 60% de la trata de seres humanos en la Unión Europea es con fines de explotación sexual, y de, en esta modalidad, el 90% de las víctimas son mujeres y niñas. Lamentablemente, la trata de seres humanos con fines de explotación sexual es un delito en expansión y el incremento de víctimas menores, de niñas y niños, también. Aquí eh, yo creo que es importante señalar que el alto grado de impunidad con la que actúan las redes criminales que se dedican a este comercio de mujeres, niñas con fines de explotación sexual es un elemento fundamental en el incremento del crimen. El otro elemento fundamental es la vulnerabilidad de las víctimas e indudablemente niños y niñas eh, fuera de su entorno familiar eh, en instituciones como orfanatos o otras instituciones de protección de menores son extremadamente vulnerables si las administraciones públicas encargadas de su custodia y tutela no exacerban en, 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 de, de gran manera esta función pública de protección. Por lo tanto, aquí yo creo que hay un uh, ámbito muy importante para poder trabajar en el futuro en la revisión de la directiva. Por otra parte, hay un elemento también fundamental en el incremento del número de víctimas menores en la trata de seres humanos con fines de explotación sexual que no podemos olvidar, que son los clientes los que exigen, piden a cambio de un precio el que las víctimas de este horrible crimen sean menores. En este sentido, lo ha dicho Juan Fernando, pero quiero reiterarlo porque me parece que es un dato muy importante, el 74% de las eh, víctimas eh, menores, eh, víctimas de trata en la Unión Europea, son niños y niñas eh, de países europeos, de los 27. El 70% de los traficantes también son redes eh, mafiosas dirigidas por ciudadanos europeos. En este sentido, y así lo citó la comisaria Johansson, cuando hablamos de la presentación de esta revisión de la directiva, tenemos una enorme responsabilidad frente a nosotros. Elementos que deberíamos eh, modificar, eh, introducir y cambiar a la vista de la experiencia de estos 10 años. El primero, necesitamos una mayor coordinación y a nivel europeo en la lucha contra este crimen en todos los ámbitos, desde el punto de vista de justicia interior, espacio Schengen, 
políticas de migración y eh, aquí hablando de eh, niños y niñas eh, objeto de trata e institucionalizados, creo que la mayor coordinación entre todos los servicios de protección de la infancia y de los tribunales de eh, menores de todos los Estados miembros son un elemento clave y crítico para poder proteger a las víctimas. Por otra parte, necesitamos trabajar en la detección temprana de las víctimas. El elemento común de todas las víctimas de trata es la vulnerabilidad. En niños y niñas está claro que esta vulnerabilidad social, económica, aquellos que, están, eh, que no tienen una familia de protección e están institucionalizados, la vulnerabilidad es mayor. Por lo tanto, trabajar en esta eh, detección temprana exige también contar con servicios especializados desde eh, organizaciones no gubernamentales que trabajan en la infancia, aquellas que trabajan en la lucha contra la trata, para poder detectar aquellas víctimas que pueden ser objeto de las redes de traficantes. Para esto necesitamos, indudablemente, también incrementar el presupuesto destinado a los mismos. Esta detección temprana debe incrementarse en, aquellas, eh, en el ámbito de la inmigración porque sabemos que los menores no acompañados en las rutas migratorias son claramente, pueden ser claramente objeto de, eh, de los traficantes y también lo pueden ser, y de hecho lo son, cuando llegan a su lugar de destino en algunas instituciones en las que son acogidos. Por otra parte, necesitamos mejores datos. Hemos hecho una evaluación de la directiva de trata sin datos actualizados y creo que en este sentido los datos que aporta el estudio que ha hecho la Fundación son realmente importantes. Por otra parte, y acabo porque sé que posiblemente me estoy pasando del tiempo, quisiera señalar la importancia también de destinar financiación en la lucha contra este horrible crimen. Las mafias, las redes de tratantes de seres humanos, de niñas de, y, y niños también, son realmente sociedades internacionales del crimen. Y por lo tanto tenemos que poner a disposición todos los medios de lucha contra ellos a nivel europeo y en coordinación con organizaciones internacionales de lucha contra el crimen. Eh, ser capaces de implementar nuestra financiación en esta lucha, pero también de perfeccionar todos los medios para poder perseguir el producto ilícito de este crimen, que son miles y miles de millones de euros, es absolutamente fundamental para poder acabar con el mismo. Finalmente, los niños y las niñas son víctimas, las víctimas de la trata necesitan ser siempre tratadas como tales, no se les puede culpabilizar, igual que todas las víctimas de cualquier delito necesitan protección, necesitan reparación y necesitan justicia, los niños y las niñas aún más, porque es nuestra responsabilidad el protegerles de caer en estas redes. Muchas gracias. Thank, thank, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Ramos, for, for your very, very clear list of what needs uh, uh, needs to be done. Um, our, our, our next uh, expert panelist is Ms. Ivanka Kotorova, who is the vice chair of the Eurogroup anti trafficking team. And Ivanka, I, uh, what would be your view on the changes that are needed and indeed how, they, um, how the directive can help? Thank you very much for inviting uh, Eurojus, the European Union Agency for Criminal Justice Cooperation, at this panel discussion. Uh, of course, child trafficking is a global problem and uh, uh, this requires a global response. Uh, thank you very much to previous speakers uh, uh, who raised very interesting questions about implementation of uh, anti-trafficking directive and uh, needs uh, uh, for its revi rev revision. Indeed, investigations and prosecutions on child trafficking need special attention. They're complex, they're difficult. 
to investigate and prosecute. They reviewed the prominent role of organized criminal groups acting often across borders. They recruit children in one country, transport them and uh, uh, expose them in uh, country of destinations. Therefore, they involve many countries uh, uh, in this chain. Uh, if you ask uh, what measures from our point of view as practitioners uh, need to be uh, done uh, in order to uh, improve implementation of uh, anti-trafficking directive or uh, revise it, uh, I can uh, point your attention to three main points, one of them. First, we need uh, early involvement in trafficking cases of judicial authorities. We often see uh, from our practice uh, that law enforcement authorities are aware and uh, collected information about the trafficking activities. However, the law enforcement authority do not always make uh, this information available and known for judicial authorities. What is uh, collected in detecting phase in informa is information which is not evidence. Information is not synonymous with uh, evidence at all. We take the risk of losing significant part of uh, criminal activities and moreover, evidence needed uh, uh, for prosecution uh, if judicial authorities are not early involved in this process. Uh, second, my point is that we need close cooperation and coordination at police and judicial level, ideally with uh, support from us, from Eurojus, and then uh, to use as much as possible joint investigation teams about uh, it uh, um, directive uh, uh, pay special attention in preamble for each country of origin transit trans uh, exploitation uh, each country sees only fragments small part of uh, trafficking puzzle therefore uh, they need help uh, in collecting admissible and solid evidence from abroad if you want to tackle trafficking networks operating in many countries because of nature of uh, cross-border uh, trafficking, we need prosecutors to meet, to discuss, to decide who you collect, what will be collected, under what conditions, because there is uh, differences in uh, different legislations. As a prosecutor, I, I, I must understand in what fashion I can present uh, evidence in my court in my country. Coordination is crucial in this regard. If uh, it doesn't happen, gaps in judicial cooperation appear immediately. Uh, previous speakers uh, uh, mentioned gaps in uh, national legislation, but I, I can add uh, a gap in judicial cooperation, which is very important as a uh, follow-up step. Eurojust is here to help the coordination of gathering uh, uh, of evidence and prosecuting strategies, including strategies for identification of all victims, their location, rescue uh, during action day, and uh, arrest of suspects, of course. In the past years, uh, here uh, at Eurojust, uh, we have coordinated around 150 cases, THB cases, uh, per year, approximately. It might not sound much uh, in terms of numbers, but our assistance provide, um, provided extremely beneficial. For year, around one third of all these cases resulted in joint investigation teams, coordinated prosecution strategy, detection, saving and protection of hundreds of victims. Let me give you an example on, uh, of a case coordinated uh, by Eurojus where national authorities use our helping hand and manage recently to bring to safety more than 50 Romanian victims, male victims, some of them under 80 years of age, traffic since 2015 for labor, uh, labor exploitation in construction sector in the UK. These victims were falsely promised good jobs in the UK, but forced to work long hours without payment. Uh, their identity papers uh, were taken by, uh, by uh, traffickers regularly subjected to aggression and uh, occasionally feed it uh, uh, themselves from uh, garbage cans 
while being forced to live in terrible housing conditions. Judicial cooperation between UK and the Romanian authorities was initiated back in 2019, and Euro just actively supported this uh, uh, cooperation by, by facilitating establishment of joint investigation team and organized three coordination meetings here at Eurojust between prosecutors of UK and Romania in order to facilitate the progress of uh, the investigation. It also facilitated the discussion between uh, national authorities on what are the needs of the victims for protection and compensation and how to uh, best address this. And speaking of compensation, I'm getting to my third points. We need financial investigation in each and every case. This is not only to follow the money in order to confiscate the illegal profits from crime, but also to identify the victims who are sending, very often sending the money, the susp suspects, and of course, uh, uh, their location and uh, connections between them. Further, I uh, have uh, read with uh, high interest the February report of European Parliament on the implementation of anti-trafficking directive, uh, which highlights some of the uh, issues that I just presented. I also uh, completely agree with uh, the European Parliament that serious challenges for investigations and prosecution are uh, represented by the use of internet social media and uh, digital technologies to recruit and export the victims of crime, especially children, abuse with them. We also think more and more in our Eurojust case work, how important it is to be able to address such challenges in trafficking cases, especially when it comes to encryption and access to such data to be used as a evidence. There are several recommendations in the uh, European uh, Parliament's report, including uh, call for the criminalization of knowing use of all services provided by victims of trafficking, which involve exploitation. If this conduct becomes a crime in member states, we here at Eurojust stay ready to help prosecutors cooperate internationally in the task of providing knowledge in uh, using the service of a victim of trafficking, which can be challenging, of course. One final my point uh, um, is related to different topic, but I, want, I wanted to uh, touch upon. It's a surrogacy matter and the risk for both the surrogate mother and child to become victims of human trafficking. This would require closer attention. We have experienced the Eurojust of cases dealing with a such complex situation where criminal groups could take advantages of legal gaps, these legal gaps uh, surrounding uh, uh, surrogacy matters. Uh, I wanted to touch upon uh, the matter about shame marriages, but it will be a long discussion. Uh, therefore, I'll stop here and thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Iv Iv Ivanka. And our, our final um, uh, contribution comes from uh, Gabrielle Upas Hope. Um, Gabrielle, I, please excuse my, I'm sure, very flawed pronunciation of your surname. I, I do apologize for that. Um, uh, Gabrielle is from Ecoris and, and she has researched the links between volunteering and, and orphanage uh, uh, trafficking. Um, and uh, really, we'd like to hear the, the main outcomes of, uh, 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 of your research, Gabrielle. Thank you. Um, indeed, um, so we have researched on behalf of the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs, uh, the size and scope of volunteerism to residential care facilities in low and middle income countries. And one of the key findings of our research was that volunteerism is indeed one of the many factors that actually uh, fuels this market. Let's call it a market for child trafficking. Um, over the years, the past decades, volunteerism has really become an industry or a business. And we found that it really works uh, like any other business with a demand and a supply side. Uh, so on the one hand, there are those uh, volunteers that are keen to travel abroad and to help out in the residential care facilities. Uh, well, those volunteers create a demand 
Uh, and this demand, on the other hand, is met by a supply of residential care facilities that actually welcome volunteers um, to help out on their premises. Now, based on anecdotal evidence, we also noticed that some of those residential care facilities um, maintain or increase the number of children that are being cared for in those facilities in illegal ways. One of them is uh, through child trafficking. We found anecdotal evidence of uh, children being lured away from their parents or taken away from their parents to be put in a residential care facility um, in order to sustain this business model. Because imagine a residential care facility without children, that wouldn't be very attractive to the volunteers uh, keen on volunteering. So we found that it's really a complex interplay. And this is also what uh, Lumos uh, mentioned in the, the report. So there is an indirect link between volunteerism and uh, child trafficking through this um, volunteerism business model. Now, we uh, came up with a number of recommendations, but today I would like to highlight uh, three of them. Uh, first of all, we found that um, volunteerism in uh, residential care facilities is one of the many factors that contributes to the continuation of residential care facilities and thereby fueling the market for child trafficking. And therefore, we urge any uh, policy or any action to also address the root causes of uh, the existence of residential care facilities. Those can be war, famine, diseases. There are many factors that fuel the, the need for a residential care facility in the first place. So we recommend that any policy would have a bit of a broader focus, not only targeting volunteerism, but also looking at the root causes. And this actually ties into the second recommendation. Uh, well, our research was solely focused on volunteer activities in residential care facilities. And as I mentioned, we did see a link between volunteerism and child trafficking. But we actually also saw a similar pattern in other types of volunteer activities in uh, facilities where childcare was central. So think about boarding schools or after school activities, crisis centers. We see a similar pattern of volunteerism being one of the factors fueling uh, child trafficking in facilities other than the residential care ones. So that's why we would really urge um, the European Commission to consider the, a comprehensive overview when, when redrafting the anti-trafficking directive and also taking into account other types of facilities uh, where children care is, is central. And third of all, we would recommend uh, ample of attention for awareness raising activities on the side of the providers of those volunteer travels to residential care facilities. Our research found that, especially in the Netherlands, the commercial providers of those travels have slightly adapted their offer throughout the past years because of the uh, discussion that's been ongoing on the dangers and the risks of volunteer travel. But at the same time, we also noticed that the smaller, more informal providers of those um, volunteer travels um, didn't really adjust their, their offer. They kind of remained under the radar. Um, they also felt like the entire debate didn't really apply to them. They don't, or not all of them, see the danger of uh, sending volunteers abroad to residential care facilities. So that's why we identified a gap and a strong need for awareness raising. Now this large group of smaller providers is also a very difficult group to reach. Uh, and one of the uh, ways to potentially reach those um, private development initiatives could be through the citizens initiatives for global solidarity. So to wrap up, uh, we would urge uh, any action or any policy to uh, apply a bit of a broader focus also to avoid any waterbed effect by on, first of all, having a focus not only on the problem, but also the root causes, to secondly, um, have a broad definition of what the problem is. It's not only volunteerism in residential facilities, but also 
other facilities where care for children is pivotal. And third of all, to not only focus on the volunteers themselves, but also on those providers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.